talk about how it shows up and all that good stuff. So, Steve, if you flip on that switch while you're back there, I want you to watch a video. It's got Peter Levine, who's the creator of Somatic Experience in here. But what he shares just very quickly with the animals and that fight and flight response, this will be just a nice quick review by video of some of the stuff that was covered this morning. So, take a look. When out of the blue we perceive threat, our bodies definitively react to protect ourselves. We do this with stiffening, with retracting, we do it with fight or flight, we do it with freezing or collapse. These emergency reactions are meant to be temporary. However, what happens in trauma is that our bodies and brains, our necks and shoulders stiffen, our guts go into numbness, our breathing quickens and goes in the upper part of our chest, uh, our heart beats wildly. Or, alternatively, we collapse into helplessness. These are all things that our body does immediately and instinctively to protect ourselves. It's to protect ourselves from the initial and the actual threat. However, when this reaction becomes chronic, we develop the debilitating symptoms of trauma. From this point on, our bodies continue to signal to our brains that we're in danger. And hence, we Look how frozen he is, threat where it doesn't exist. Leg. Until we're able to change the internal sense of our body, we will remain traumatized because our bodies will be continuing to send that message up to the brain. In somatic experiencing, i.e. the experience of the body, individuals are guided to change their bodily experience and in doing so, move out of trauma. They learn that they can shift from fixity and helplessness to slow vitality and wholeness. This is a further illustration of what Stephen Forges calls the polyvagal theory of emotion. The social engagement system involves the most recent parts of our brain in the prefrontal areas of the neocortex. As you can see from this chart, this system allows us to be in relationship, not just with members of the opposite sex as in the illustration but with each other. The system communicates with facial expression and with vocalizations that we make. So, for example, the soothing voice of a mother calms her upset baby. If the mother is unable to calm the baby, then the baby will go into a state of distress, the sympathetic fight-or-flight response. Fight-or-flight response involves a mobilization of our limbs, of our legs and our arms. And again, this is to escape or to fight. Then, if this doesn't resolve the threat, or if the threat is perceived to be mortal, then the most primitive system, the system involved in mobilization, takes over. And as you see in the bottom part of the figure, this system shuts down our lungs, our hearts, puts our gut into overdrive. It overactivates our intestines and therefore uh, creates symptoms of gastrointestinal distress. These are profound nervous system states, the states I've just described. We can't talk the person out of fight or flight or shut down. It has virtually no effect on those systems. The, I mean, we are able to get some soothing with our voice and with our facial expression, but once that has been hijacked by the sympathetic or the shutdown state, we lose what makes us the most human. It's through body sensation that we're able to actually move out of shutdown, move into arousal, fight or flight type states, and then return to social engagement. And the SE therapists help track the client moving through these different states until they come back to relaxation and feelings of goodness and wholeness. Whenever we experience novelty in our environment, such as the snapping of a twig. Our biological response is to orient towards the location, the source of that novelty, and to discern what is the relationship it has to us. So, for example, is it a source of safety, a source of food, a source of shelter, or is it a source of danger? And if it is a source of danger, well, what should we do next? In this video, you'll see an example of a herd of impala peacefully grazing on their afternoon repast in an upland glen. Then suddenly, one member of the impala detects something, and you'll notice that. You'll see the ears perk up. They're trying to localize the source of the sound and to determine whether it's a threat. 
Now, when they do that, their posture also stiffens. And as their posture stiffens, the other impala pick up the same sense of novelty, of needing to scan, of trying to locate through, through, through sound, through smell, and to some degree through sight. They are hardwired to seek out what might have caused the first one's ears and the first one's body to, to change. So they're all starting to search. So because of this, you not only get one set of ears and nose and mouth, but a dozen. And so if one doesn't locate the source of trap, the other ones will. It's kind of like a hot potato that gets passed around. One animal perks up, then the other, and then others see those two, and then they perk up. Pretty soon, the whole herd is ready to take off. They don't need to have the cheetah upon them before they make their exit. This is the fear arousal cycle. When we first experience novelty and orient to the novelty, then we perceive threat, we become progressively aroused, and as the threat becomes more imminent, the arousal takes us into fight or flight. If we're unable to escape, however, that is to say, for example, somebody's holding us down and preventing us from escaping, then that induces a combination of fear and immobility. So the fear causes more immobility, and then the immobility causes more fear because we're held down and we can't escape. And fear and immobility feed on each other. And this is what keeps people locked in the trauma response. We'll see now some examples of the immobility response in animals. In the first vignette from YouTube, you'll see a dog moving towards an opossum. It's not really even threatening, but it's moving into what's called its strike perimeter, where the opossum knows instinctively that if the dog made a lunge, that it would be able to get to the opossum. So it goes right into this immobility response. It appears to, as though it were dead. And the dog sniffs it and just goes off its way. Now, in the wild, say a coyote came to the opossum, the opossum went into the immobility response. The coyote needs the resistance to stimulate aggression and needs aggression to stimulate uh, eating. If the, the inert uh, opossum offers none of this, it goes off on its way searching for livelier prey. As I said before, immobility and treason are time sensitive. So the animal goes into the immobility response, as exhibited by Br'er Rabbit here. And for all intents and purposes, it looks like it's dead. It's in rigor mortis. But then after a period of time, it just flips over and off it goes. Just as I shot, and I got him just back of the friend's shoulder, I got him in the ribs instead. But a big male like that should be okay. It's a good thermoregulating area. Hi. Get an animal like that, and he's just still blinking there. Yeah. Oh, no, that's all right. He's just he's perfect. perfect. He's absolutely perfect. 
You see the size of getting a bit bigger neck and so on? Yeah, so. Oh, holy snappers. He's about as big framed as you'll probably get. Watch that animal after he finishes convulsing. You'll see because he's aware of the fact that we're all around him, and it's a very stressful experience for an animal like a polar bear. And after he settles down, then he'll start doing a couple of deep breaths, and then he'll breathe really nicely. And it'll really, I go, here he goes. See how he's breathing there now? So even though it looks a little unpleasant, it's kind of like that effect. It lets off all that stress, and, and he then is able to relax and, and uh, sleep the thing off. If we are frightened and are being held down by somebody, it's the combination of fear and the immobility that keeps us in the trauma response. And the key, actually, to coming out of trauma back into life is, in principle, quite simple. It's to uncouple the fear from the immobility. You see, because immobility by itself is not intrinsically fearful. And in this next clip, you'll see an example of this where a mother leopard is, is carrying her cub with her mouth, and you see the cub is just limp and is not at all frightened. As a matter of fact, this is in people report immobility without fear is often experienced as being pleasurable, sometimes even profoundly pleasurable, almost blissful. As we begin to come out of uh, the arousal state, we move towards the restoration of the active response when the person is able to go out of the immobility. When they're guided by the therapist to come out of the immobility and shut down, they move into a state of arousal which you can work with. This is the mobilization for fight or flight. So just as they come out of the immobility, they may feel the impulse to move with their arms and their legs as though they were running. And again, the idea is not just to to voluntarily run, but to feel the running response, the, the fight or flight response from the inside, and being able to complete it in a way that feels successful and feels pleasurable and mostly feels empowering. In this video, you will see the distillation of five sessions of therapy work that I did with Ray, a Marine who was uh, blown up by two explosive devices in Iraq. He served in Iraq and Afghanistan. And you will see how he moves from being really severely debilitated by PTSD and other uh, issues to restoring his vitality and his uh, purposeful direction in life. I've been struggling with is probably just PTSD. Yeah. Dealing with uh, this really large crowd. 
this happened on June 18th of this year. And uh, in, in the beginning, I had to kind of teach myself how to walk, talk, and think again. Uh, I guess every day has been getting a little better, kind of. Um, now, mostly, I'm dealing with the uh, uh, sen- sensitivity to bright lights. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, lack of concentration. Mm-hmm. Um, headaches. Now, you, you just said that you learned to walk, talk, and think again. Mm-hmm. How did you do that? I just thought for a lot of things. I thought for a lot of things. Everybody told me I would push things too much, but I just thought for everything that I wanted because because I wanted to be able to. I I don't like it when people take care of me. I can't stand it. Mm-hmm. So I mean, yeah, you want your independence. Yeah, exactly. I want I wanted my independence back. It it sucks at night. Really. Uh, see. It sucks when it comes time to sleep with the fear of actually going to sleep and having a nightmare. The involuntary movements that you make with your head in black like this, mm-hmm. when did that begin? I want to say like a month and a half after, after the blast. The core symptoms of Ray were this, what was diagnosed as Tourette syndrome. Now, however, from my perspective, it was not Tourette syndrome, or it had a, the, the so-called Tourette syndrome had a very different um, way of looking at it. Here's the situation. You're walking along in, in a stressful situation, right? It's, it's a war zone. And all of a sudden, there are two explosions, and they're so powerful that you're blown up in the air. Well, the body is trying to do two things, at least two things. One is to try to orient towards where that explosion is coming from, because biologically we're wired to try to identify a source of threat. Then, at the same time, as the ex- that his body goes into a protective response, it's like a, 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 a flexion response, the way a turtle pulls its, its head into its, its shell. And because this happened so fast, he was, his nervous system wasn't able to integrate that. And so, in a way, he keeps replaying that initial moment when there was the explosion. If you were able to separate them out, they're the very beginning of a turning towards localizing the source of the disruption. And then the body trying to protect itself, trying to pull its head in, trying to flex itself and make itself into the smallest target. And this gets stuck. The initial part, the shock part, has to be worked on first. Otherwise, if you were to work with the emotional part, you would very likely be actually just reactivating even further the shock reaction. And somatic experiencing differentiates between these two. And I'd like to see if we can get you some tools so you can stretch this out so that these, these reactions are a little bit softer. Here's what I'm going to have you do now. I want to have you very slow, very gentle, Opening and closing your mouth, just the smallest amount, and then come back a little bit, and then just go to where you feel a little resistance. And as you do that, that will trigger those movements probably, but will also give you a chance to feel what was going on before the jerks. Okay, so just let's just do that together. Okay. Did you feel what happened that time? There was this uh, tingling sensation in my body. Exactly. It's really good. You, you made the first step there. Okay. Okay. That's it. That's it. Why did you feel just before that happened? Or just when that happened? Weird tingling feeling. A weird tingling feeling. Okay. And where do you feel the tingling? Hey, what is Kind of starts like in my entire body. Okay. Okay. Keep on for this, okay? Excellent. Stay with it. 
about the crowd. Well, I think, <laughs> I think it's, it's even more fundamental than that. I think you're just more relaxed. So, you know, sometimes on a foggy night when the boats are coming in, the Coast Guard boats and the other boats, the, the foghorn sounds. And it makes a sound like something like this. relaxation kind of feeling. Yeah. That's a pretty good description. Because honestly, when I first came, my very first session, I remember in L.A., I thought this was the dumbest thing in the world. I, 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 honestly, I, I was so resistant to it. And I was like, you know what? Screw this. Let's put in, let's put forth the energy needed for this to work and see where it goes. And and the uh, the payout of this work I noticed from the first session of my twitching was tremendously down and and it's I knew that when I would start twitching that I could just remember what he did in the session and do it on my own. That was something that he gave me that I could do without him being there. And I, I could not twitch as much. On Wednesday, I saw myself heading towards a eight and a half or nine with the no pain idea. That was pretty cool. Um, but honestly, that really hasn't changed. I, I could see the eight and a half, nine uh, with Peter's work and with me continuing to do it on my own time, I could honestly see that. I would say don't stick with just medication. Don't think that completely numbing someone through medication is the answer. Look into other means of healing because it's out there. You just need to look for it. I hope that this brief video has given you an introduction to nature's lessons healing trauma, that you've been able to see how what we can learn from the natural world and also about brain function really gives us a, a, uh, a foundation, an understanding of how to help people move out of the horrifying, debilitating symptoms of trauma back into vitality, life, and wholeness. shared there, and I know it went kind of quick in one sense, 
But this is what we're going to kind of learn some of the basics of and be able to practice for ourselves and, and help other people practice. I like this video because I like that he ends with Ray there. So you got the story about him being blown up. And oftentimes, it's those kind of physical sensations. So as we move on now and talk about what gets stuck on, gets stuck off. In Ray's example, just because you saw it, it got stuck on. So think about it. He's a military guy. He's walking with his buddies. And this bomb goes off, this IED on the roadside, blows him up, sends him to the hospital, he wakes up, I think it was two weeks later, and kills one of his buddies. Well, what developed was considered a Tourette syndrome, but as you saw, Peter didn't see it that way. He saw it as a defense mechanism response that got stuck, that never got to give complete. So I want to just do it for you, because this is what you'll see, either in yourself or other people that you are working with. So in Peter's, or in Ray's case, I mean, imagine um, that you're walking along the road and the bomb goes off here. Of course, a bomb is super fast. But the first thing you're going to want to do, now that we know how it's supposed to be done, right, is you're going you're gonna to have a startled look, right? You're going to turn and orientate. And then if it's a bomb blowing up, you're going to try to duck and cover. Now, when all of that happens really fast, he didn't have time to complete that action. So I hope you heard what Peter says. He got stuck in a loop in his nervous system. So if you could complete that reaction, if you could slow it down, you would have enough time to get up here, shield yourself from the explosion, and probably yell out, Bomb! Or, Help! Notice my wide open mouth. What Peter had him do was simply chew on air and feel in his jaw the point where you feel a little resistance. Because that was one of the first things that the body could have done had there been more time. Help! Right? And so what you see is he's stuck in a loop of trying to turn and duck and maybe even yell for help. But then that gets stuck in this threat looking loop of Right? And he can't, he does this uncontrollably all the time, and they throw medicine at him, right? So Peter helped slow that down, and here's where that intentionality came in that I talked about. Slows that down, even in a simple thing. So even repeating the process might be too much. This is where we don't want to repeat trauma, because trauma is too much, too soon, too fast. If you go there too quickly, if you jump into all the exercises too much, it could be, oh, it can overwhelm your system again. This is why, as I mentioned earlier, for some people when they go to therapy and they tell their abuse story, for example, you know, well, when I was a kid, my uncle, and, you know, next thing they know they're in the midst of this abuse story and, uh, you know, and they wonder why they never want to go back to counseling. Because everything in their body is going, ah, freaking out again, even though they can look really calm and cool, sitting there on the couch or in the chair, you know, in prayer ministry or therapy or whatever, but inside their nervous system is going, you know, get me out of here, beat me up, Scotty, you know, just, it's, it's trying to complete an action that never got to complete. So, how does all that show up? Let's look at that and then we'll get, try to get real practical here. So, one of the handouts I'm going to give you is instead of looking at that, give you a bunch here. I just want, there's a whole lot on here, obviously, and I just want you to see, I want you to just see from this that your body's organ system are controlled by the parasympathetic and sympathetic. That nerve you see there running down the spine, your spinal cord as well as the vagus nerve, controls a lot of these nervous systems in your body. And they all have to respond differently according to the stimulus. All I want you to see is why when we talk about stuck on and stuck off, it might show up physically. Did you hear me? Look at your paper now that most of you have got it. Hopefully you've got enough. Did we get enough? We're still we're still six short. Okay. Um, Steve, would you mind making photocopies for me? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to do that on the board. Um, yeah, if, 
if you go in the office, no. If you go in the office, just it, it should be set. There's no code or anything for the copier, but it will be automatically on black. So change it to color and then make another two copies. It is pretty simple. I think I figure out. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, so I'm going to put this on the board about the parasympathetic. I just want you to see from this diagram, and I'm sorry you guys didn't get it ahead of time, but I just want you to see that all of our body parts are controlled by the parasympathetic and sympathetic, right? So, for example, dilated pupils, right? That's that sympathetic response that wants to open up the eyes so it can see the danger. Well, if that gets stuck on, right? We can literally see it with people who look like they're staring all the time or have really big eyes. It can also show up in a startle response. These are the people where there's a slam in a car door and they, they jump, right? That's kind of that stuck on, sympathetic, high up charge. So, just so I can so talk about it here. Easiest way I think to look at it is with this kind of what's called a window of tolerance. And I'll leave that one up there in a moment. Now remember, we have both of these at the same time, both sympathetic and parasympathetic. It's not one or the other. I don't want this chart to confuse you. It's not an on and off. It's just which one's more dominant at the moment, okay? This is a window of tolerance, meaning most of us should live in this window throughout the day. So we wake up, we're down here. We're going to be more parasympathically, can't say it, parasympathically um, dominant because we're asleep. We're at rest, right? That's why it's hard to get out of bed, some of the stuff I shared earlier today. As we get up, we're going more towards the sympathetic. We get our morning coffee, woo, right? <laughs> Now we sit on the sofa or, or go for a quiet time or whatever before work. We're going to drop down a little more parasympathetically because we're a little bit more at rest. Time to go to work, we get up a little bit more, and so on. You get the idea. There's an ebb and flow throughout the day. What happens, though, in trauma, and now in, remember my definition of trauma, too much, too soon, too fast. So I'm talking at least about the trauma B part here now, the shock trauma. Something happens right here. It can happen any, anywhere in the cycle. That's not good. It can happen anywhere in the cycle, but just for the sake of it, it happens right here. It will send us into high sympathetic. That's the fight or flight. Okay? So here you have fight or flight. So someone yells fire. Right? We're going to get out of there. We're going to run. Fire! Oh, where? Where? We orientate, we run away, we're trying to get out. That's going to send our heart beat racing, right? It's going to cause us to break. Right? All of that is normal. That's how we're supposed to live. We're supposed to be able to have this so a few minutes later, half hour later, not too much longer, we are away from the danger and we drop back in here. We might be a little bit more activated, but at least we're down in here again. That's the normal way it's supposed to happen. We're supposed to have that. That's a good thing, right? It's what keeps us alive, keeps us safe. Often, though, what happens is when people get up here, they can get stuck on here. And so their life looks like this. In other words, their new normal is high sympathetic or stuck on, hypervigilant, right? Short breath, can't really fully get breath, always constantly on alert. Those are some of the symptoms of that stuck on kind of thing. We're going to look at that a little more. What I want you to see, though, in the, the diagram is your bodily systems, and you're getting them right now, looks like. He's got them. Your bodily systems can physically get stuck on or stuck off. So this is why it shows up in our physicality. Parasympathetic is rest, digest, and just to give an example, in sex, this is, is a common one we can relate to, sex is very parasympathetically, but it's also parasympathetic, but it's also sympathetic. So for us male, we need to be at rest long enough to get aroused, but the actual erection is sympathetic. It's the same bodily system, 
both are needed. For you women, you need to be much more parasympathetic at rest, to be open, etc., to be able to receive sex. But orgasm is sympathetic. So even in one system, to use my, my sex example, one system, you have both of these things happening at the same time. This is why people with ED, for example, erectile dysfunction, have a hard time because they're so parasympathetic, they're not getting any sympathetic charge to be able to maintain an erection. Sometimes that's medical, sometimes it's about blood flow, doctors go that direction. Sometimes it's just about trauma. Trauma that got stuck in the body. I'm dealing with one guy who that's his situ situation, and now that we've uncovered his trauma story with a former wife that yelled at him, it's like it's starting to make sense to him. Because he tries to be intimate with his new wife, even though that he's been divorced for a long time, and long story short, it's difficult for him in this area because there's something about intimacy and sex that even though his head fully knows, I love this current wife, this other wife was 20 years ago, you know, his head's got the timeline. His body in bed is going, ah, <laughs> this is freaky again. See, just as an example, just even how you know, a sexual problem, for example. Yeah. 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 No, it's a good question. So why when you're stressed out, right? If, if you need this for sexual arousal. Well, you need, so this is where good sex happens. You need this for orgasm, for erection, but when you have too much of this, you're stressed out and therefore can't be relaxed enough to even have sex. Does that make sense? Yeah. So in the bodily system, even as you can see there, both, both sympathetic and parasympathetic are attached to the different organs. They respond differently. They respond differently. Our heart is amazing. Sympathetic charges gets that heartbeat going. But if it worked for something that they've identified as they call it the vagal break, our heart would literally beat out of our chest and we would be dead. But there's sort of this break mechanism that happens that still allows our heart to beat like crazy. <laughs> right? But we're at least not blowing our heart out of our chest. So it's interesting how they even, and so like aneurysms and things like that, oftentimes they're stress-related. People have heart attacks and so on. Why? Right here. It goes so sympathetic, it's too much and overwhelms the nervous system. Physically can show up in their heart, skipping beats, aneurysm kind of stuff, strokes, all sorts of ways because we're so fearfully and wonderfully made. Really interesting, isn't it? So all I want you to see is, even though we don't have time to go through how it would <coughs> show up in all the different organs, I just want you to see that they're affected. So, for example, the person who lives up here, guess what? They oftentimes have digestion issues. They can also have digestion issues if they're too low and freeze. I'll get to that in a moment. But they have digestion issues up here because they're so on, their body never has a chance to go, and that's why we rest and digest. This is why after a good meal, we sit around, you know, like after Thanksgiving, when I'm belting our belt and we belch and we don't want it. Because there's that digestion process going on that makes us want to go, uh, this is why we get sleepy after we eat a good meal. This is why I know as a teacher, now after lunch, I have to be a little more entertaining for you because... I know what I'm facing. It's not just we had a lunch. It's because your body needs to be more parasympathetic to be able to digest that lunch you had. So, therefore, you will be sleepier. Yeah? Yes, so this is where anxiety lives, right? So, anxiousness, the number one problem in the world. Anxious people. Anxiety is high sympathetic that never has a chance to rest. How does it show up? Restless leg syndrome, right? The person who's always got to be doing this, got to be 
you know, kit. He buys, you know, the, you know, buys the little fidgety, spinny toys, right? He's, you know, tapping, you know, playing the constant activity. It's because their nervous system has learned that this is the now the new norm. So to have them slow down, sure, they can do it for a few moments, but then everything starts to, right? Starts to freak them out again. So this is why people have a hard time with quiet times, for example. Because when you live up here all the time, and now I've got to sit and read my Bible and pray, right? Is that an amen, brother, or a question? No, <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so so your adrenaline glands are on high high alert all the time, and that's why we get adrenaline fatigue. Absolutely right. And that's exactly why we turn to addictions here, because this is where drugs, alcohol, porn, masturbation, orgasmic kind of stuff that takes takes you into this kind of high, but then allows you to feel the because they're artificially trying to get back down here. Our body is always aiming for homeostasis. That's the fancy word meaning balance, right? So it's always, our body systems are constantly trying to work on homeostasis. Yep. That, that's the scary thing. And, that, and that's this, okay, for those who, Three weeks ago, we're at my wife's seminar. This is why she went in the whole area of digestion and why my wife Lisa taught on digestion. Because as we started working with trauma survivors, we started to see that digestion issues were so huge. Because they're up here all the time, high alert, that it shows up in their body like this. And so to answer that question about youth and because of all, all that they're into, that you were asking, Steve, they're living up here all the time in such, you know, Constant screen time, video games, you know, the next latest, greatest, entertain me. It's so much high energy that the nature of addiction is not going to get even higher, right? Or they have to do something artificial to try to get them down. And they think, they think this is restful here, right? They think getting down in this area is like, oh, dude, we're finally chilling. No, they're not. Their body is still really stressed out, and then it starts to show up and we have, we have diabetes, for example. I don't know the statistics anymore, but my wife would be able to spout them off better than I do. But, you know, diabetes is getting younger and younger and younger. It's because our body systems, the adrenal glands, the pancreas, you know, and insulin, all these things are getting so stressed out because they're on, on all the time. So, yeah. Yes. The question was, can environmental toxins take us in? Absolutely, because they interfere with our body systems. This is what my whole wife's seminar was about a couple of weeks ago. They take our body systems into this higher, into this higher sympathetic state as well, because our body's trying to fight off disease, fight off infection, fight off toxic elements in our body. Do you hear the word fight? There you go, Steve. Yeah. So, are you talking about the whenever I'm afraid? Yeah, right. Life all stuff because you're you're imitating with intentionality the startle response. <laughs> whenever I'm afraid, I will trust in you, O Lord. Or some people do this. There's different variations. You're teaching your body. I can go up here. And I can relax. This is why roller coaster, bungee jumping, right? Because people love the thrill of this, and that what they—if you really ask them what they love—is that feeling when they come back down and they survive. That's the high, sometimes the higher high. So now we're going to push it a little more. We're going to go a little higher this time, right? We're going to do a little less cord on the ankle for the bungee jump or whatever, right? <laughs> Yes, they Where does ADD, ADHD come into play? I think, obviously, there can be physical things that cause this. 
But I think because so many people live up here, young people are up here, that to sit in a chair and listen to school lecture, everything inside of them is going like this. And so this it gets diagnosed as ADHD or whatever. And so we got to shoot them up with Ritalin. Where actually it's a nervous system problem and not a drug problem. They have. It has been very effective. Yeah, very, very effective. Sure. Yeah. Kind of let them like, spread this stuff out on the floor. Let the kids do some results. Sit right with them and let them do it. Yeah, you're talking their language, so to speak. Yeah. Mm. Cool. Thanks for that comment, sir. Yes. Yeah. This kid. Sleeplessness can show up here, right? It can show up here, uh, and, uh, and I have this problem. Sometimes I wake up at 3 and 4 in the morning, ding, right? Some of that's age. Some of that's, I, I can tell by the day before I didn't take enough time to relax. I push, 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 work, 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 get one more thing done. Then I can sit with my favorite beverage and watch my TV show and relax, and yet it's like 9 o'clock, and so I really don't have time to unwind. So what does my nervous system do? I fall straight to sleep. I don't have any problem falling asleep. But my nervous system goes, you need more unwinding time. So ding, four in the morning, and I'm wide awake. Yeah. Right. That's a good question. How does that work early in life when you have sleeping problems? Like for you, you couldn't go to sleep and your mind just races. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Often, not always. Sometimes it can be medical things. Sometimes it can be you had too much caffeine. Right? It can be a lot of a lot of other contributing factors. But sometimes it's just basically down to trauma that's unresolved in your nervous system because your nervous system didn't get a chance to complete a reaction it wanted to. So going back to Ray, had he been able to do this and duck and cover, he probably wouldn't have developed the Tourette's, right? But it got stuck in his loop. You see this, for example, I'm going to get to down here to the freeze, but I'll just give an example. You see this down here in depression. Because people wanted to express their anger, wanted to get upset, wanted to fight for injustice, and couldn't. And so instead of what should explode, implodes. And so the implode energy of anger and righteousness gets imploded, and the person feels helpless, hopeless, lost, and turns into depression. And that's the loop. And so we go at it, you know, with lots of good tools for depression, but if we don't include the body... We're missing a whole piece because then we're trying to talk them using CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, or other tools, trying to talk them out of their depression or goal setting or medicine. We just need to pump you up with some more, you know, circle or something to lift that SSRI, blah, 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 right? And all, all we've done is miss the whole point that it's stuck down here. Their body is stuck in that depression. Yeah. Yeah. 
Continue on here. I know you have more questions. I'll see if I can kind of answer them as we go. If, or I shouldn't say if, when you come up here, but you cannot complete fight or flight, so it's the inescapable attack, right? It's the danger, stranger danger, rape situation, whatever. Your body, nervous system, the amygdala, will go down to here. Down here, when it's really low, um, parasympathetic. Is your freeze, collapse, or fold? If you want to keep with F, can't spell collapse. Or if you like to keep the F word here, fold. And then underneath that, try it right here, is submit. Now let me explain these for you. So when your nervous system can't escape, when fight or flight wasn't an option, or you tried it and it didn't work, instantly you'll drop down and freeze. This is the fainting, this is the collapsing on the ground, this is the covering of your head like the slide, you know, the, I can't do it, I can't make it, I can't make it work, I'm now in that deeper freeze. It shows up in collapsed postures, so this is the person sitting in the chair, arms, elbows slumped in, kind of slumping a little more on the couch, perhaps. Sure, it could be a posture, it could be a tired, right? So it's not 100%. But oftentimes you'll see the emotional connection. There's therapists that actually just work with people's posture to help them correct their emotional moods. It's amazing. We're so more interconnected than it's than imaginable. Just by changing your posture, right? You can feel the, you know, try it sometime. When you're down, notice you're down. We call this slump. Right? Try just standing up more straight. You know? Just see what it does to you. Getting in tune. It's that intentionality. Sure, you can stand up straight and won't do anything for you. It's that intentionality connecting and feeling your body. So, what happens down here is they go into those kind of things collapse. Let me talk about cement. Any of you interested or work with sex trafficking? Some of you. Yeah. So this is what you see. This is why prostitutes and kids and sex trafficking will go right back to it. And we scratch our heads and go, why? I got them out. I rescued them. I got them a safe house. I got them money. I got them a new job. And they went back to their pimp? I don't understand why. Well, actually, the explanation came years ago on what's called the Stockholm Syndrome. You ever done basic psychology 101? Long story short, the literal bank robbery in Stockholm, Sweden. The captives were, were taken captive, obviously, by the bank robbers and held hostage. You buy, if you know anything about Sweden, which I do because I live there, by the time the police negotiated with the hostages, it was many days. And what they found flabbergasted them that the hostages who were absolutely anti, you know, bank robbers, captives, actually joined their side by the end of the hostage crisis because they learned something really interesting in their nervous system, that if you can't fight or fight, fight or flight, if you can't freeze or fold, you will eventually go to the lowest form, which is submit, because it's a survival technique. It's just easier to go with the flow. So we will do this ourselves. Like, I don't want to confront the person. I don't want to rock the boat. It's just easier just to submit. So this is where some troubled marriages come in, for example, where a wife or husband is submitted. And I don't, when I use the word submit, I'm not talking the biblical definition of submit, okay? I'm talking about the fold, freeze kind of submit where I give up. I can't do it. I'm not talking biblical submission. I'm talking, it's so deep, they're not even aware of it. They function normal. They look normal. They 
you know, can do normal stuff with their body, but emotionally they have just gone into such a deep collapse that it's turned into a, 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 a cement. And sometimes what they need is something to really rock the boat enough to get out. Sometimes people have to go to the bottom of the bottom before they're willing to get out. Anybody's worked with addiction or addiction, you know, drug addicts, alcoholics, and so on, know this. And sometimes people have to go to the very bottom of the bottom before they're willing. Notice the word will. <laughs> willing is where their soul part of them kicks in, willing enough to do something about it. Because submit's just the easier way to survive. Submit is just the easier way to survive. So how do we write that? If they're down here, they need more sympathetic. If they up here and sympathetic, they need more calming, more parasympathetic. Very simple. So your question, Steve, how do, how do you break that? If they're up here, they need more of this one. If they're down here, they need more of this one. What does that mean? That's what we're going to look at very practically. For you guys that are here that are therapists or, or here as helpers, your best work, with the people you pray for, minister to, counsel, do therapy with, is right here on the edges of the window of tolerance. What does that mean? That means the person that's way up here, you're not going to get them down here or even here in a session. But if you can get them down here to the edge, your best work will be done with them. Your best prayer ministry will be done with them on the edge of the window of tolerance. If they're down here and you get them a little activated, your best work will be done here. I just simply, I'll use this. I just simply do this. If I talk into a guy, that's that's a ball or something a little heavier. And we're talking, doing counseling, and if I could catch with one hand, <laughs> we're just talking like this, and I'm just, we're just throwing a ball back and forth. You know what we're doing? I'm giving, yeah, exactly, and I'm, give, I'm giving him more sympathetic charge just simply by throwing a ball. Because by doing this, he has to concentrate and he has to think and look and he's got to throw it. He's got to use his arm or she, right? So just as simple as talking and throwing something like that can be really helpful. Thank you for being my little demo. Just a small little tool, but that's enough for some people that are maybe down here, not way down here, but some are down here, maybe just to get them enough activated to bring them into that window of tolerance where there'd be more work. Because otherwise, they'll sit on the sofa like this. And then I know they're too sympathetic. Parasympathetic, sorry. I keep switching. Par they're too parasympathetic. They're too low down. So they need some sympathetic charge to get them up, right? And they're still throwing a ball. Will that be that way? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's actually something about when you have to do something physically and with both hands that helps you process memories. This is where EMDR and other techniques come in because you're going from right to left hemisphere. And so even with memory and memory care, because you're asking about the elderly, that could be a very powerful tool by just changing hands, alternating tapping, things like that that, you, that use your physicality in right and left brain areas. So... That's a very quick explanation to a longer one. Yes? Yeah, great question. Um, the question was, can, do most people live up here in fight or flight, or do they live down in or a freeze or vacillate? All of the above. The anxious people who are primarily anxious will be up here. The depressed people will primarily be down here, but here's the really weird part. And before I tell you it, let me give you an illustration you can all relate to. Everyone here drive? Okay, I want you to want you to put your feet out in front of you like you're going to drive. And if you went to driving school, you were taught to only use your right foot, right, for the gas, and your right foot for the brake, unless you have a clutch car. Okay? So for this demonstration, I want you to use both. And I want you to put your left foot on the brake first. Okay? Sorry. <laughs> I'll mirror you. Okay, I think it's easier. Put your left foot <laughs> on the brake, and I want you to start the car. Okay? Now I want you to put your left foot hard on that brake, 
And now put your right foot on the gas. And now tell me what's happening to you and your car. You're not going anywhere. You're revving. What else? A lot of tension. Tell me about the motor. What's happening inside that motor? It's stressing big time because it can't go anywhere, but it's got full gas. That's a lot of stress. To answer your question, the weird combination is the people who are stuck on and stuck off at the same time. And a lot of people are more stuck on and stuck off than you think. Because part of them is stuck on and part of them is stuck off, and they've got the gas and brakes on. And so they show up both symptoms, depressed but anxious, right? And I'm not talking to text and stuff, <laughs> right? They're, they're depressed, they're depressed, they're anxious, they're nervous, they're hypervigilant, they're fully on, and yet they're lethargic, energyless, can't get out of bed. But inside is an engine going, oh, oh, oh. Can you feel that? That's a stuck on and a stuck off all at the same time. Really, really weird combination. Harder to work with because you kind of have to pick one. Yeah, at, at, least at, at least at the moment, you have to choose one at the moment what you're going to focus on because to try to focus on both is too much for your nervous system. Yeah, focus on where the, where the gas is or where the brake is. Yeah. Yeah, that's a harder one to deal with. Let me show you a little bit more, and then we'll we'll uh, do some questions around it too. To my, I think I, I think it died. Steve, can you hit the well, the light the lights on? Yeah, yeah. Just hit hit my. Uh, then it totally died. I'll restart it here in a moment. What I want you to see here, though. I'll draw it this way. Is if, is if they're normally here, can you think of times and places where you got activated, went way up here, right? And then you should, you should, and maybe came down later on that day or that hour or something like that. So, to use my example, someone cutting you off on the highway, right? You're going to be sympathetically activated. You're going to honk your horn. Ah, right? Get out of my way, you crazy idiot. Right? Or whatever. And then a few minutes later, hopefully you relaxed enough and you're okay. But have you noticed that maybe in that example, places where you were stuck on, can you think of places in yourself that are anxious? So let me show you other ways before I restart my frozen computer, I guess. If someone, I'll demonstrate with this chair. If someone's sitting in a chair, look at my feet. Now, this would be a, a smaller chair, but if you notice my feet here, do you notice my feet? That could be somebody who just likes to sit that way comfortably, but I oftentimes, more often than not, this is a fro, uh, I'm sorry, a flight response, not a freeze. They're actually subconsciously sitting this way because it's easier to spring out of the chair. So, Little things like that you can be aware of, even with yourself. Find yourself like in the next time you're in a situation where it feels a little uncomfortable or it's a little bit awkward, things that are happening, you know, that you don't like. Tune in your body. Notice your feet. Notice your energy. Are you trying to flee? Is there a part of you that wants to fight? How does fight show up? Anger. Tight jaw. Particular. This is one of those ones where people, you know, they're like, oh, I have to go to the dentist and I have to get special things because my dentist says I grind my teeth at night. I hear that and I think, trauma. Someone's angry and it's not getting expressed, so they get in sleep, subconscious land, and, right? They're at the anger, they're grinding away at their teeth. Do you want to just restart it for me? Oh, you do. Oh, you know what? E exit it and, and turn, turn on the PowerPoint back on for me. Hit, 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 yeah, hit escape and yeah, I must have got stuck in that one. Okay. Did, I think this is called a freeze. <laughs> it went into freeze mode. 
So while we're trying to fix that, let me give you a few more things, and then we can take a little break and make and get it fixed. But think stuck on, think sympathetic for a moment, right? How do you see it show up in yourself or other people you know of? Just throw some things at me. Yeah. Out of the deadline. There you go. Constant business, yeah, because your nervous system learns this high on all the time, and then has a harder time to relax. Yeah. Oh, sorry. She said constantly on, constantly busy. Mm -hmm. Rumination, absolutely. People who ruminate get stuck. Things going over and over in their head can't ever seem to relax. Yeah. This is why they've done studies, for example, on uh, vacation time. And having lived in Sweden myself for 12 years, where most Europeans get four weeks vacation to start with, most of the average have five or six, they've actually learned that it takes a full two weeks to unwind from working before you actually rest. What does America do? You're lucky if you get one week. And then if you do get two weeks, you have to almost get special permission from your boss to take them in a row, right? So we don't know how to unwind. <laughs> yeah. They, they did a, they, I know, they did it, they, how that came out, how they found out about that. They did a study on work and work productivity and found that people were much more pro productive after having at least four weeks off in a row than their, like, U.S. counterparts that maybe only had two. And so the productivity was well worth it to give them five weeks off versus only two. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, that's Finland, but, but yeah, exactly. Fin Finland is the highest, but Sweden's close to it. But that's more because seasonal depression, dark nights, things like that. Yeah. All the cold north there. If you... Yeah, perfect. Thank you. You can find the right slide. So, any other ways that stuck on shows up that you're aware of yourself or wonder about? Yeah. Sure. Have a hard time focusing or concentrating. If that's you, what your body is trying to tell you is take a break. But because of deadlines <laughs> or something like that, we try to push farther and we actually become less productive. One of the best things you can do, and they're finding medical research about this. I mean, literally, is to take even a 10-minute stretch break. You know the popularity now of these stand-up tables, for example, in workplaces? It's because they found that just people getting up Right? So they have, you know, settings on Fitbits or fancy watches, you know, that will beep at you every hour so that you just stand up. They find productivity changes that way. Focus changes that way. Because most people aren't taking enough break, so their nervous system is tired of being up here. So it's begging you to come down here. That's why we end up surfing YouTube and looking at our Facebook account at work. Because really what we're needing is a break. But we're not able to get it, or we don't allow ourselves, or our company doesn't allow ourselves. So it's just easier to flip through phone photos than it is to actually really take a break. Right? There you go. Constant changing, yeah. <coughs> yeah. So put away the phone, get outside, and allow yourself to come down here. Yeah. Right? All those little kind of practical things. Did you get it to work? Hit, hit, hit shift, shift F5. There, there you go. Thank you. Beautiful. All right. So, just a review. If this is your uh, three parts of your brain, your survival brain, and some call the reptilian brain, your emotional brain, your limbic system, and your neocortex, or your thinking brain, 
when you think of stuck on and stuck off, where do you think we do most of our processing about it? Exactly. And where is it stored? The survival or emotional brain. So how do we change that state? If we can't think our way out of the box, so to speak, how are we going to change that state? Oops. So, if we're in fight, flight, or freeze, and you can see the different ones up there, when we first try to escape, if that doesn't work, then we try to fight, right? So that's the bear. We see the bear far enough away hiking. We're going to back up and try to get out of there. If we open up our tent in the morning and the bear is right in front of us, right, we're probably either going to try to fight, maybe, if you're bold enough, or you're going to collapse down in your suitcase, or suitcase, your sleeping bag, I mean, put your hands over your head and hope for the best, right? So, depends on how much we feel the threat at the moment. Also depends on how we respond to that. So, why I'm repeating that again is because when we talk about how to heal it now, we have to do the opposite of trauma. Trauma is too much, too soon, too fast. Guess what the opposite is? Slowing it down. Slowing it down. Because then it becomes less threatful. If the bear is right here in my face, that's really scary. If it's a half a mile away and I can see it from the other side of the, you know, the forest, the, the little meadow, I'm pulling out my phone or my camera to take a picture. Because it's no longer a threat. It's, oh, cool, bear. Right? All about the proximity. Slowing it down in your nervous system changes the sense of the proximity for you. Let me give you an example. Um, you know what? Before I do this, let me give you my own example. So, I'm going to be, uh, be a little vulnerable here, <laughs> but it's a good example, but a little vulnerable here. So, I noticed something about myself, and I didn't really honestly give it a whole lot of thought, but maybe some of the guys in the room will relate to this, but when I would go into public restrooms to use the urinal. You know us ladies, we have these urinal things we stand in front of. I noticed that I had a hard time to go pee. Now, I'm just being really vulnerable and honest with you. If the restroom was empty, it was no problem. But as soon as there was people in it, everything inside me tightened up. And I looked online, I Googled this, and found out if you do map problems and think about your check balancing. Balancing your checkbook, it helps, and it did. But not fully, if I'm honest. Yeah, please. <laughs> and then it showed up that I noticed that when I would go to restaurants, I would, uh, without really thinking about it, innately find a booth where my back could be up against the wall. I hated, hated, hated when the only spot was left in the middle of the restaurant, and I knew people were walking behind me. And I just thought, you know, it wasn't super big, but it was enough to make me uncomfortable where I'm like, I found myself looking around a lot and feeling this anxiousness. I honestly didn't think about it very much. Kind of just one of those little quirky things, you know, you sort of live with and you don't really think about. So, but it would show up at least in public bathrooms because I would walk into, like, going to Kansas City Airport, you know, when there's a bunch of guys in there. I'd go find an empty stall. You know, I didn't need to use the toilet. I only needed to pee. There's a vulnerability for you. <laughs> I would go find an empty stall because when the door closed and I was in that my little stall all by myself, ah, you hear the relaxation, and I could peek. Now, many years later, I'm going through this thematic experiencing, and one of the things you have to do is you have to get your own counseling and experience this kind of stuff. So I'm getting my own counseling, and I don't even remember what we said we would talk about, to be honest with you. But I, I, I said something like, you know, I have... As I'm sitting here, and the lady that was doing the therapy with me probably just had me sit with my feelings, which is one of the things I'll, I'll share with you or teach you. Just sitting there with my feelings, and this memory came up, and I said, it's really random. She's like, well, go, go with it. So I said, well, I remember as a kid uh, that my dad, my dad was a high school teacher for a while, and I, and I lived in Castro Valley, California, the Bay Area, and my dad was teaching at the uh, San Leandro High School there. And I remember going to a high school football game. Now, when you're six years old, high school football players with all their garb on, you know, they're like gods. 
And so I was in this bathroom, standing in front of the urinal, doing my business. And these other football players came in. You know, as a kid, you're like, wow, cool. You know, they look like giants. And they were horsing around and goofing around. And one guy pushed the other guy. And the guy came, came this direction and bumped me. And I went into the urinal. And, of course, they're high school students. And they all started to laugh. And, of course, felt the flush of shame and the embarrassment, and I honestly don't remember anything after that. I just remember the shame of it. I'm sure my dad took me back to the game, and probably, I don't know if I watched the game, I don't know how fully present I was, I really don't remember very much, but I very much remember the push into the urinal and the sound of laughter. And so I didn't even make the connection between that and the restaurant, but I did make the connection with the going to the public bathrooms. So I said that to the lady, and so, like the good SE therapist she was, she was like, so what do you notice in your body, Eric, as you're telling me that story? And now she's observing me, and I'm like, well, I notice, you know, I, I feel a little flush in my face. She says, yeah, I notice that too. <sighs> a little, little tighter, to, you know, a little tight breath there. Said, yeah, I know so too. And she said, yeah, I notice your heart rate's beating faster. Because if you look, if you look at specific points, you know, you can tell when people's heart rates are in. Like, yeah. And, well, what else do you notice? I said, yeah, I'm kind of uncomfortable. This is really awkward. You know, I'm telling you about going to pee and you're a lady. And, you know, so we had kind of a good little laugh about that, but we kind of moved past it. And then she said, so what if you could slow that down? And I kind of knew what she talked about, but I didn't know. So what do you mean? Well, first of all, she takes me to the end of the story. How did you know you were all done? How did you know that trauma was over? I said, well, I don't remember a lot, but I remember my, you know, I remember the, the football game. I don't know if I remember the beginning or the end or what, but so tell me about the football game. Well, I'm, I'm thinking, yeah, but I just told you about another story. Why do you want to know about a football game? Well, what she was doing with me is she was trying to resource me. So because here's, here's the lesson I want you to learn. Um, as you're doing this for yourself or helping other people, we all want to dive into the trauma story, right? I'm paying for counseling. Gosh darn it, I'm going to get my money's worth. <laughs> we want to hop into this story, and even something like that can be too much, too soon, too fast. One of the ways to slow it down is ask the person when they know they were out of that. And even if I couldn't remember, I, I said, well, I can imagine we probably watched the game. And so what were games like for you? Oh, I love football and I love the, you know, I started talking about it. And now I'm no longer having the flush in my face and my heart rate settled down, my breathing settled down. Unbeknownst to me, very much aware, my, my therapist was very much aware, I was relaxing. What happened? I took myself up here by starting to tell the story. And she helped me come down here. What did that do? It helped me learn the flexibility. It helped me learn to know movement. A lot of times people are stuck. We call it stuck for a reason. Their nervous system doesn't know the flexibility. Oh, sure, they can go home and have a beer and, and relax, and they can go to sleep. They'd be dead if they didn't sleep. So it's not like they never relax. It's with the intentionality around the event or the emotion they just experienced. And so she was resourcing me. So I got to talk about football, and yeah, we used to go back home, and my dad would make a whole bunch of cocoa, and sometimes he'd invite some of the students over because my dad was really outgoing and loved to have the students come over. And So she'd ask, well, so what was that like? Oh, I don't remember, but I just remember the smell of hot cocoa. Take a moment and smell hot cocoa, Eric. My mind can go, well, that's stupid. That was, you know, 50-some years ago. But in that moment, I can like, hmm, hot cocoa. See, our imaginations are powerful. Remember, our, our brain has the timeline. Our body, my body could, ah, I could imagine sipping hot cocoa. What was she doing? She was giving me a sense of connection, comfort, safety, grounding me in my body through my senses. When we work with people's bodies, so now we're being practical here. When you work with yourself, Work with your senses. What do you smell, taste, touch, see? Most of us in trauma get very tunnel-visioned. 
usually all we see because we're looking for the exit. We're looking for the fight, right? Or we're down here in class and don't see anything. So a lot of times sight is one of the first things that goes or one of the first things that can be brought back online, but we oftentimes don't think of the other senses. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You got it. Beautiful description. Yep. That's exactly right. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I need to hand the mic because you, you, yeah. So what she was saying is it resourced me. It got me, even though, um, you know, I maybe couldn't remember all the detail, got me thinking about the cocoa, the connection with family, the social engagement piece, the interaction. So I didn't feel alone because in the moment of trauma, you feel very alone. Even though my dad was there in the restroom and probably whisked me out in that moment when you're the object, you're the only one in the urinal and everyone's laughing at you, you're very much alone. Yeah, absolutely. All right, I give you the microphone. Okay. I just had a question on that because it sounds like um, I'm trying to understand if you're saying that it kind of does bring you back to a place of safety and you're not in the heightened sense, but is, is that similar to the healing of the memories? Yeah. So let me answer that by going through the rest of the story, because actually that's that's not the end. But what she was doing is resourcing me enough so I could learn that I can go there and I can come back. Let me use it in Christian terms that you might be able to relate to. If I use my body, I touch a little bit into the painful memory and I go back to the peace of the Lord. Go touch a little bit more of the peace of the memory back to the peace of the Lord. What does that do? That allows us to do this fancy thing called pendulation, like a big old pendulating clock, right? We're going into a little bit of the trauma, but not too much, because otherwise it's too much, too soon, too fast, and we repeat the trauma. But it also allows me to pendulate back into the place of safety and connection. And you're only doing it a little piece at a time. Like the ancient Indian proverb, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Exactly right. <laughs> One bite at a time. And the fancy word for that is titration. So if you're a chemist here or work in a pharmacy, you know that term very well. Right? Measured out a little bit at a time. Because too much is too much, too soon, too fast. You're repeating the trauma. So she's helping measure me out and pendulating me back a little bit of the pain back into a place of peace. Now, this wasn't a Christian. We have so much better tools as believers with the presence of the Lord, but at least bodily in that moment, I could go from the embarrassment, laughter, to hot cocoa and being with my family. All right, so there's a little bit of movement there. Then here's what I want you to hear from it, is when I could slow it down, she said, now imagine that same thing happening, but in really, really slow motion. What is she doing? She's slowing down the trauma effect on me. So she has me slow it down so I can see the guys over here roughhousing. They're doing it real, real, like, you know, that, you know, kind of slow motion. That's how I'm imagining it. And now the one guy gets pushed and he's moving my direction, very slow motion, right? And so here's another great question to ask yourself or ask the people you're helping. What's the impulse of your body? Because when it's slowed down, I have time to do it. Like Ray, he would have time to fully complete this. What was the impulse of my body? I said, I just want to lean in. That was it. She said, okay, go ahead and lean in. So I just, I, and she's like, now feel it. So here's the intentionality. Now feel your body lean in. So I'm literally sitting in a chair, and I'm, I'm literally moving. I'm literally feeling myself lean in. Now what happens next, Eric, she says? Well, I see the football player coming, but because I'm leaning in, he goes past me. 
And she said, then what happens? And watch my head. I'm watching him, so she's having me orientate, right? So she's having me repeat the trauma, but this time I'm in, in control. Did you hear that? I'm repeating the trauma in slow motion, but this time I'm in control. So I am using my head. I'm orientating. I'm watching, because before I was doing my business and standing in this direction, right? Now I'm watching this football player come. I feel in my body lean in. I'm watching him go past me, and I turn my head, and I watch the football player go flying into the door. And now all the guys are laughing at him. Did that actually happen? No. Does it need to? Not from my nervous system perspective. Right? This is where our heads get in the way. Because the head wants to say, yeah, but we should be on truth. And we need to stand in truth. And, right? <laughs> but in this case, let, let me finish and then I'll take your question. In this case, my body got to experience, I got to be in control and lean in. And I got to change the outcome. And that football player went flying into the door. And they all laughed at him. She had me just sit with that. Now feel that. Feel that he went into the door. What do you notice now in your body? That's a great question to ask yourself. Don't ask what happened then. Nobody remembers what happens then. You might remember some feelings like embarrassed or something like that. But our body needs to experience it in the here and now. So the questions are, what do you notice now, Eric, as you're telling that story? What do you notice now, Eric, as you lean forward in? <sighs> she noticed my breath. I literally took that breath. I said, man, that, that feels good. And then this is one of the things you learn in SE. Good's a great word. How do you know good in your body? <laughs> right? Because people say that all the time. I feel fine. I feel great. I feel good. How do I know good in my body? Why that question? Because it helps me get in touch. Yeah, how do I know good in this thing I call a body? Well, let's see. Well, I notice I can breathe better. I notice that I'm still leaning forward, but I can sit back now and it's okay. And I'm relaxed. See, I had to put words to this thing called good feeling. What I was doing, for you who does EMDR, you'll, you'll appreciate this, taking the trauma out of my, I'll mirror you guys, taking the trauma out of my right hemisphere, putting words to it with my left hemisphere language, and being able to resolve the trauma verbally and tell the story around it, where there wasn't a story so much before. I had a different outcome. Now, i got to be honest with you. After the session, because I was required to do it, I was like, yay, Check, you know, she signed my paper. You know what that's like. Sign my paper, you know, so I can get all my, my credits and all that kind of stuff. And I walked out of there and going, okay, well, that was kind of interesting. But to be very honest with you, it wasn't that impacting. It really wasn't. I was like, okay, well, that was kind of interesting. At least I got my, my credit for my one-hour session. Thereafter, all of a sudden now I'm in public restrooms going, wow. It doesn't bother me to pee. There's guys walking all around. I can sit in the middle of a restaurant, and it's still not, honestly, it's still not my preferred place to sit, but I can sit in the middle of a restaurant and go, I, I'm okay. Something shifted in my nervous system. At the moment of that therapy session, I didn't think it was a big deal, but something shifted because my body, hear this, my body got to complete an action it didn't get to complete. It doesn't matter if it was 50 years later or five seconds later. The body doesn't know a timeline. So this impulse to move my body forward was enough so the football player didn't hit me. He went flying into the door instead, and I felt <sighs> it's that <sighs> that lets go of the trauma, brings you down out of here of the anxiousness, because that was me stuck on in this area, back down in here. I also noticed it was easier to have quiet times again. Interesting effect. Not related, but something about related in the sense of the nervous system being able to relax more. I find that I'm not quite as fidgety. I still probably live a little more here, honestly, than I'd like to, but I noticed it had gone down more. I noticed I was able to <sighs> and rest. So there's my, my story of it. Does that make sense to give you a very practical illustration? Yeah. 
hundreds of these over all the time. A year. Yep. Right. Good question. So what about a soldier who has hundreds of this during the time? Does he get to complete it with just one or how does he deal with that? Um, it all depends. Everybody's nervous system is really different. So what one guy might be able to do seems to like a domino effect, seems to carry all of them. Other ones might have to come in and do different sessions around different events. It so depends. Yeah, it so depends. But oftentimes it's that completing an action you didn't get to complete. So I'll give you another example because I work with abuse survivors. One of the things is in an escapable attack, they couldn't fight or flee, right? They know in their head they didn't get to run away. But their body gets a chance, even sitting there in the counseling room, right? Sitting there feeling running and their abuser or their attacker is behind them, running away, feeling as they sit there in the chair, imagining going to a safe place, you know, stopping and smell. Well, what's the safe place look like? How does it smell? What sounds do you hear? I'm trying to tune them into all five senses. It helps ground them in that moment. Their head knows they're in my office. I know they're in my office. But what they don't know is that their nervous system gets a chance to get away. Another thing I do is with a pillow, and the person will push, and they'll get in touch with the motion. They don't have to think about their attacker. That would be too much, too soon, too fast, right? I don't want them to do that. But I want them to get in touch with that emotion of just leave me alone or get away or whatever comes up in that session. Just by pushing on a pillow, I'll brace myself like this. They'll push really hard, and I'll lift up this foot and let them win so that they push me back, and I go flying into the wall or my door. And it's that feeling that they get of, oh, I finally got to win. They know full well, this is me, it's not about me, that's in the office, it's a Tuesday morning, you know, all that stuff. That doesn't matter. It's their nervous system gets that, I finally got to win. I finally got to finish that action that didn't get to com be complete. And oftentimes I find that when it doesn't work the first time, sometimes they have to do it over and over time. Sometimes they have to get in deeper places emotionally to feel that. So it's not like a magic pill. It doesn't always work instantly. But what happens is when they get that chance to complete the reaction, the energy gets let go. Yes. <clears throat> Wonderful question. How do you, if someone calls for help and no one comes, how do you complete that? This is where holy imagination can come in. We get to, you know, who would you like to come to your help and rescue? You know, if they're Christian, they might say Jesus. Well, double check with that because first they might answer Jesus because they're a Christian because it's the right thing to do. They might also be pissed off at Jesus because he didn't help them, Right. So we have to be careful with that one. So I use the question, who would you like, real or imaginary, to come and join you? That allows Hulk or the Superman or, you know, superhero or whatever. It allows dead Grant Betsy because she was my caretaker. You know, it, it allows anybody to come into that moment and answer that call for help. Yeah. Absolutely. But to, but to feel it, here's the key I want you to hear. Feeling it in their body when they're doing it, because otherwise it's just imagination. Then they're going to walk away. Well, that was a weird bunch of BS. Yeah. But when they feel it in their body, that's what, when they connect with, okay, this is, this is how it shows up in my nervous system. And you're looking for in yourself when you're dealing with your own healing, you're looking for the, and I don't mean just the breathing. I mean that sense of, Oh, that release, the settling, yeah. Yes, absolutely. When you have pre-verbal stuff, you have ch early childhood abuse things, right? All those kind of things where there isn't a story to tell. They don't even remember anything. You look for how the body remembers. 
So maybe it's like, I don't know why, you know, I've had it, the doctors check it out, but like my right shoulder is just tight all the time. And I've seen countless chiropractors and well, I'm just, you know, give me an example. Well, here's where the body talks. So I don't need to know a story. They don't know a story. So in traditional therapy, you're kind of stuck. But when you just use the body, you can go, well, if that body that's really sore and stuck right now had a mouth of its own. So pretend like there's a little mouth right up here in that short. And it could say anything that it wants to. What might it say? It's really an interesting question to watch what comes out. Right? It's so interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean, they, in that kind of case, they might say, you know, I, I literally had a pastor. It was a different, different from his stomach, but he, he literally, get the hell off me. And he went like this and went, like, he, wa he wanted to, you know, I'm like, no, don't worry about the swear word. Get, just feel it. It isn't about swearing or not swearing. Feel that. What is that? Just get the hell off me. And when he could really go there and it wasn't filtered by his brain because I'm a pastor, I shouldn't say those words, and got to actually say it, whoa, there was an emotional release. Or this arm, for example, that, you know, says, no one's there for me, right? And they don't even know why they said that because there's no memory. Now you have a body that's talking that does remember. Do we have a story around it? No, but it's enough to work with. Yeah, so for that example, when they said that, so in that moment of understanding your shoulder says, you asked how, does, how do you work with that? I gotta repeat that. How do you work with that? In that moment where your shoulder is, is saying no one was there for me, what does your shoulder need? Feel that impulse right now, right? Well, it feels like it just needs somebody there. Okay. What does it need? It just needs a hand right here. I might offer to put my hand there if appropriate, right? Or they may put their own hand there. Oftentimes they just need this. This is what we do instinctively, right? My, my favorite example I give all the time is little Johnny who goes outside and plays and falls down and skins his knee, right? What does he do? He runs into mommy, right? Mommy's not home, it's daddy, but it's always mommy if, if a kid gets to choose. And so what does mommy do? Mommy picks up little Johnny, she brushes off his knee, she kisses, mm -hmm, kisses the little owie, puts a little, you know, Batman band-aid on there, kisses it again, and Johnny goes running out to play. Did anything change on a skin knee? No. Physically, not really. Maybe she cleaned it up a little, gave it some kisses. What was the difference? Time and attention. Yeah, love. Time and attention. What we do when we're slowing down the trauma in our own body reactions, so this is, goes back to the catching the pre, pre, when we feel that first, that first reaction, that first sense of here it comes again, or we feel ourselves brace, right? Do you know what bracing looks like? You can feel that in your body. Your body tightens up. You might grip your hands, you kind of hold your breath. Those are bracing. That's bracing for an impact, right? You catch that ahead of time. What does my body need? It might just need time and attention. It's amazing that just by focusing on, I feel tight breaths, or I feel butterflies in my stomach and I don't know why. Okay, feel the butterflies in your stomach. Long silence. Sitting with that emotion. Sitting with that physical sensation. It sounds so stupid. And so therefore we don't do it. We go, this is stupid. I need to go fix it, for a guy especially. <laughs> I need to just do ABC. If I could, no, just sit with it. Slowing it down, giving it time and attention. Wow, I notice butterflies in my stomach. More times than not, when I ask a person after a few seconds of them noticing the butterflies in the stomach, what do you notice now? Nine times out of ten, it's a whole lot calmer. Why? I didn't do a thing. They did by giving it time and attention. Because like little Johnny, he just needed time and attention for the owie. We don't give ourselves time and attention. And what we're afraid of is we're afraid of diving into our trauma story, right? So we can remember when XYZ happened when we were 10 years old. And oh, heck no, I am not going there, right? And so we do everything to avoid it, numb it out, and so on. But what if we were just sit with the thought of, it's hard for me to go to XYZ when I was 10 years old? That's enough right there. 
or the thought of thinking about talking about XYZ when I was 10 years old. Uh, makes my chest really tight right here, and I have tight right... Just notice the physical sensations. You don't have to go into the story. Just sit with your own body sensations. Because when you sit with it, you're giving it time and attention. You're doing intentionality on the place it shows up physically to see what it has to say. What does that do? It makes you curious. It makes you open, accepting, and loving. COAL, an acronym to, to remember. C-O-A-L. Curious, open, accepting, level. What are you doing? You're being relational. Ventral vagal. You're being relational with yourself in that place of pain without having to dive into the story. Because nobody wants to dive into the story. Right? It's too triggering. C-O-A-L. Curious, open, accepting, loving. Cole. It's just a good one to remember as you're sitting with your own feelings or you're helping somebody else process theirs. Just curious. Don't try to fix it. We all try to fix it. Especially us guys. We're notorious for that. Be open towards it. What's it want to say? If it had a mouth of its own. What might it say? Accepting. Let's just see what it has to say. Even if it does want to scream and shout or swear or whatever, right? And loving towards that response. Because that's what mommy does to little Johnny. She doesn't shame him for getting the owie on his, right? Maybe some moms do, right? And that's why we have trauma A. <laughs> see, curious. We have trauma A because we were shamed. Mom said, why are you being so careless? Don't you know those are new genes? Right? And then we never want to go to mom anymore. But anyway, that's trauma A. <laughs> but if we have good parents, they, oh, come here, John. Right? They're giving it time and attention. They're not really changing this thing, but it changes it emotionally. This is that connection to your limbic system, to your emotional brain, because you're feeling it in your body. You're, you're noticing the butterflies in your stomach or your, your tight chest or your hard breathing or I feel flush in my face. Whatever you're feeling, my jaw is tight and I'm really angry and I don't know why. Okay, feel that. Don't try to fix it. Just be curious. Just try to be open. Try to be accepting, loving with it and see what happens next. That's all you're doing. Not fixing it, just see what happens next. You'll be amazed at what it does for you and the people that you help. Loving, yeah. Loving or lovable. It's about love. It's all about love. Yes, Steve. Break time? Yes, I was just thinking the same thing. All right.